whatever you wind up doing is exactly what you should be doing. And I have not behaved one single day of my life, not one day of my life have I behaved, and I am fine. I need your help. I can't tell you what it is. You can never ask me about it later, and we're going to hurt some people. Who's Kyle we're going to thank? Happy Friday. Thank you for joining us on the Nikki Maduro show. A big thank you to Kim McAllister for filling in for me solo yesterday while I was at the doctor's with my daughter. Everything um, was really, really good. It was good news. So thank you to everybody that reached out with your emails and your prayers and everything like that. They worked. Um, Not totally in remission with her Crohn's, but no inflammation seen, which is the best thing that we can hope for. So very, very excited um, that hopefully things are going to start looking up this year. And uh, and yes, thank you, Eric. Everybody was reaching out yesterday and I really do appreciate it. And of course, I appreciate Kim McAllister for so talentedly stepping in a big show. We will. I don't know if you guys have seen it yet, but there is a big announcement from Oakland. Yes, they finally have. A new police chief. Uh, John Rothman is going to be joining us. He's waiting in the wings right now. He'll join us in a couple of minutes to do a political roundup there as well. A bunch of stuff to talk about from Trump to, you know, the government shutdown to everything in between. And we love having John on every single day. Tim Sika will be joining us towards the end of the show, of course, to talk all things movies. And is anyone in line right now listening to the Nikki Maduro show Waiting for Pliny the Younger. Um, I I can't imagine waiting in line overnight for a beer. But if you are, I tip my hat to you. Uh, (laughs) You love beer way more than I do. All right. Before we get to John Rothman, though, click the thumbs up button. Show your support for the show. It really helps us out. Uh, YouTube loves it. I love it. And I really appreciate all the support that we get. The super chat is also live. And so just look for the dollar sign in the uh, under the live chat box and you can give us a super sticker, a super thanks and a super comment. And you guys have been so generous and and myself and Kim, we really do appreciate it because this is a lot of work. It is quite the hustle to do this show every day. And so your your support really is so appreciated and we do not take it for granted. Uh, also sign up for our Patreon. You could find it on our show's website, the Nikki Maduro show.com. Our Patreon link is right there. It's a one time a month payment. Thank you to all of you guys that are bumping up your payments because you want to continue to see the show. We love it. We love you guys. It is just so, so needed. And I love PayPal just as much as you do, Ricky. Ricky loves PayPal. We love you, Ricky. So if you want to do PayPal, just go to paypal.com, put in the email address, the Nikki Maduro show at gmail.com the Nikki Maduro show at gmail.com and you could donate whatever you want. And PayPal doesn't really take a cut that much like Google does, but we love Google. We love YouTube. We love the stickers. We love it all. So whatever way you can help support the show, we do appreciate that as well. All right. It is Friday. So let's get into the political world and around the political world with the one and only John Rothman. Hello, my friend. Happy Friday. And to you, and I'm so glad your mini-me is doing well. Please tell her I send warmest good wishes. And all I can say is whenever Kim sits in for you, it's just great, and she does such a great job. She is awesome, awesome, awesome. And first, before we get into anything, Spencer, thank you, thank you, thank you for the $5 super sticker. Happy Friday. Glad your daughter is feeling better. And uh, yeah, so as we know, these things last, you know, but it's good news, and I'll take good news where I can find it. Is there any good news politically, John Rothman? Um, I don't think there's very good, much good news for old Donald Trump and his assets. So uh, explain it to us. The time is ticking for him to pay this bond. It's over, you know, it's a huge amount. What is going on? $464 million. Okay. By the way, how do I remember? Mm-hmm. I remember in the Goldwater campaign in 64, ah. I saw the tie clip that says AU. 
gold, uh-huh. H2O water 464. Oh. So all I can tell you is if Barry Goldwater were alive, he'd be rolling her in his grave <laughs> because he wouldn't be able to imagine a Republic. $464 million. So uh, hit that like button, ladies and gentlemen, and <laughs> you can send just a fraction to Nikki and Kim. Exactly. I'm not asking for $464 million, people. I'm only asking for a little bit. Um, do Okay, re- look into your crystal ball. What do you think is going to happen? Uh, I was at a, uh, we had friends over for dinner last night. Uh-huh. I was asked the same question. Okay. I have no idea. <laughs> Donald Trump is stuck. Yeah. He either has to pay up or the Letitia James, the attorney general of New York, mm-hmm. has indicated that properties will be seized. Right. Now, I can tell you that if Donald Trump can't come up with $464 million, Letitia James is going to go ahead. And for Donald Trump, that's very bad news because his whole brand is at mm-hmm. stake not just his properties. So we'll have to wait and see. Uh, By the way, there was a major development just moments ago. Marjorie Taylor Greene filed a motion in the House, which essentially to vacate the chair, which means that the Speaker Johnson is in big trouble. It's a decision, but it shows the dysfunctionality of the Republicans. So between Donald Trump and Speaker Johnson and Marjorie Taylor Greene and, well, the United States suffered uh, something of a defeat today, no surprise. Uh, a ceasefire resolution was introduced uh, for Gaza in the Security Council. You know that there are five permanent members of the Security Council, the United States, uh, Russia, China, Great Britain, and France. Any one of them has the power to veto a resolution. China and Russia vetoed the resolution, which, by the way, condemned Hamas called for freeing the hostages, right. called for humanitarian aid and a ceasefire in Gaza, and the Russians and the Chinese vetoed it. So one thing after another is is boiling to the surface. So these are real issues, and in a presidential campaign in which real issues ought to be debated, we seem focused on Donald Trump. Well, I mean, as you mentioned on your podcast, you talk about Donald Trump because he is the 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 nominee. I mean, he's the presumptive nominee, what have you. He's going to run against President Biden. I mean, I agree with people that are like, I'm so done talking about Trump. Why do we always talk about Trump? Is ignoring him an option? I don't no. think so. It's not. He is, he is going uh, short of something happening. He will be the nominee of the Republican Party for president of the United States. You cannot ignore a major presidential candidate who is running very well in the polls, almost even with Biden. Mm -hmm. He has a shot at winning, and therefore everything he says is critical. Let me also be clear, because I I described this on my podcast yesterday, but I want to do it with you because I want to reinforce this. Mm -hmm. And that is that he called General Milley a loser who showed us that in Afghanistan and uh, in uh, his general attitude toward the military. It's stunning. Uh, I have to tell you that you will recall that Donald Trump, uh, when General Milley, after the election of uh, 2000, uh, uh, rather of uh, of uh, this last presidential election, uh, uh, went and called the Chinese and said, look, uh, it's going to be okay. There'll be an easy transition of power. Do you remember what Donald Trump did? Hmm. He immediately called for the execution of oh. General Milley. All I can say is this man is unfit to be president. Now, I know this is not a partisan uh, broadcast. That's not my intent. If Joe Biden or any Democrat had made the same statement, I would be just as indignant. So we're going to have to see how this this comes out. But I will tell you, by the time I'm with you next uh, Friday, we will know the answer to the question of whether Donald Trump can come up with the money. Right, exactly. It's going to be, I mean, I don't want to show my partisanship here, John, but it's going to be pretty fun to watch. Um, Now, again, the House of Representatives passed the $1.2 trillion spending package, and I believe that this is what led to MTG, Marjorie Taylor Greene, at least one of the reasons why they want to vacate that that chair. We need to keep the government open, John. I mean, this seems to be a, a thing that we deal with all of the time. It's not it's not rare that we're always on the brink of a government shutdown anymore. And I think the American people are so tired of it. But how does this play out in an election year for voters? Okay, divided into several parts. Hmm. First of all, I do not believe the government will close. Neither the Democrats or the Republicans can allow that to happen. They're going to kick the can down the road, no question. Number two, all Marjorie Taylor Greene needs are all of the Democrats 
and three Republicans, two Republicans technically, but I'm going to say three just for a margin of error, mm -hmm. and Speaker Johnson will be history. What that shows is that the Republicans are incapable of governing the House of Representatives. They are dysfunctional. Number three, that means that in the presidential and congressional election of 2024, as the American people not only decide the presidency, but who will control Congress, they will have to take a hard look at the Republicans' dysfunctionality. And I believe that uh, that accrues to the Democrats more opportunity for success. Let me be very clear. The Republican Party is no longer the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. It is the party of Donald Trump. It yeah. is the party of Marjorie Taylor Greene. It is the party of Matt Gates. It is the party of extremism. And the American people don't vote for a party that is extreme. I would remind you that Richard Nixon once told me, when a Democrat runs for the nomination, they run for the left, to the left. When a Republican runs for the nomination, they run for the right. But when they try to win the election, they have to run to the center. And the one who gets to the center first wins. Yeah. Well, I'd suggest to you the Republican Party has a serious, serious problem. And uh, how they're going to deal with it, we'll see. By the way, one other quick point. If Donald Trump continues to get into the kind of trouble he's in, if he continues to make the kind of comments he is making, and may I say, as a Jew who lives in the United States of America, his comments about Jews the other day, absolutely appalling. The American people have to wake up and understand, Donald Trump really is an existential threat to American democracy. I don't say that lightly. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? It is the last thing I want to say. But the Republican Party will now have to deal with its own dysfunction in Congress, in the presidential campaign, and whether or not the Republican Party is the Republican Party or whether it is the party of Donald Trump. There was a news this week that the House Republican budget is calling for raising the retirement age. It endorses, quote, modest adjustments to the retirement age for future retirees to account for increases in life expectancy. This happened the same week that, you know, the U.S. Ex uh, life expectancy rose, um, obviously following COVID. For men, it's 74.8 years, John, in case you're, you're wondering. Females, no, no, uh, let me just add, I just turned 75, <laughs> so I'm beating the odds. Okay, there you go. So in women, it's 80.2. We are living longer, John. Um, but politically, saying the words, raising the retirement age, I don't think this also helps Republicans at a time when people look to them as if you just mentioned total dysfunction. But let's take the issue of Social Security and, and your thoughts on, on the idea of even raising it for future retirees. Nikki, you, you recall that for 11 years and 11 months, but who's counting? I worked the overnights on the weekends on KGO. Mm -hmm. And when a night was slow and I wanted to really get people to call, <laughs> I would say, how many of you live on your Social Security? Mm, right. The board would light up like a Christmas tree. Uh, all I can tell you is people rely on their Social Security. So one thing I will tell you, the Republicans are not talking about affecting people's Social Security today. Right. They are talking about your Mine. Social Security. Mine, exactly, that I'm still paying you. into all this and, and And your children's Social Security and your husband's Social Security. Uh, so I, I, what I want to be clear about is Social Security is not an entitlement. An entitlement is something that we need to understand. You paid in, you're entitled to get your money out. Mm -hmm. That's what the word entitlement means. And so uh, I think there is a serious reckoning coming. Uh, let me remind you that there was a great debate in the presidential election uh, when George Bush ran against Al Gore back in, in uh, 2000 about whether or not there was a lockbox on Social Security. We have raided Social Security to cover deficits, to improve our financial standing. All that money needs to be put back. Mm -hmm. And I happen to believe that any attempt to tamper with Social Security will be a disaster. And by the way, it's not the question in my mind of raising the age. It is a matter of extending how long you have to pay into Social Security. When you reach a certain point, you don't have to pay in as much. Right. I think that has to be lifted. Hmm. I don't mind paying in. I don't mind insuring future generations. Social security is a critical part of our country. And may I add, Medicare is as well. 
Right. You will now have with your daughter, and she may have for the foreseeable future, larger medical expenses. Yes. Exactly. And even if you're covered by insurance, you are aware that there are millions of Americans who can't afford supplemental health care, millions of Americans who rely on Medicare to make sure that they are secure in terms of their health. Uh, this is something that we cannot tamper with. It's the heart of the American people, really and truly. So the Republicans are going to have to deal with this question. Speaker Johnson, by the way, is in favor of raising the age. And you will recall that Republicans have in the past talked about privatizing Social Security. I remember this vividly. George Bush waited until he was reelected in 2004 <laughs> to begin talking about privatization. And if he'd said it before, there's no way he would have been reelected as president. Uh, privatization is a disaster. And you know when we learned that, Nikki? We learned it in 2008 when the economy collapsed, when the stock market collapsed. Imagine if we'd privatized Social Security, what the implications would have been for millions and millions of Americans. We are the wealthiest nation in the world. And to, to diminish uh, people's opportunity to live a secure life in their elderly years is a disgrace. Medicare, Social Security, these must be protected pure and simple. Yeah. And I just, and it's not as if life gets any easier or that older people have it easy to find a job if they can continue working in their older age, because we know that that is also an issue for people once they hit a certain age. So that does seem like a non-starter for so many voters. On the Democratic side though, John, I want to talk to you about, you know, there seems to be more headlines, even though uh, the, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court said what it said about uh, President Biden's student loan forgiveness. Uh, we are still seeing headlines just this week of student loans being forgiven, specifically this time for public sector workers, Correct. police, fire, teacher, things like that. Does this issue still play off uh, well for Democrats? Because I would say, I, I, just as you talk about Social Security and the board lights up, when you talk about forgiving some college debt, especially among people who have already paid their debt, it can be quite divisive. Do you think President Biden should use this as a win? I think it is a win. Uh, there are millions of younger Americans who are saddled with huge loans, and they, they don't have the ability to pay them off. So my point is, really, when it, somebody goes to college or university or a trade school, for that matter, they're building for their future. It's 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 an investment in their future, which means it's an investment in our future. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to take a hard look at costs. By the way, that's not just college. That's nursery school. I know we're beyond nursery school, you and I, unless you want to tell us something we, we uh, <laughs> know. No, uh, totally beyond it. Okay. <laughs> Thank so God. <laughs> the, the answer is that when you are talking 20, 30, 40,000 in some cases, $50,000 a year for a year of nursery school, exactly. there's something out of whack. I sit with a group every week that is suggesting strongly that money be found to fund tutorial for preschool, first grade, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, because if you can't read when right. you're graduating from the third grade, you're not going to be a success in, in school. So we have a lot of things that need to be improved. And may I say, with all the discussion about international affairs, all the discussion about uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden and all the rest, we better think about that. Let me quickly throw in, because I want to talk about Robert F. Kennedy, who oh, yeah. uh, Jr., who is now qualified on the ballot, I'm told, in several states. Uh, he only becomes a threat if he is on the ballot. And if people would only understand that Bobby Kennedy Jr. is not his father, no. He is a man who opposes vaccination, believes in conspiracy theories. And on St. Patrick's Day this year at the White House, the Kennedy family was invited by Joe Biden to gather. All the Kennedys were there except, of course, Bobby Kennedy Jr. And his family has made clear they oppose his presidential candidacy. Right. I think it is very important to understand whether you like the choice or not. We have a choice between two visions of America the vision of the Republicans versus the vision of the Democrats. And that's what the American people need to vote on. We need to decide what direction we want to go in as a nation. Uh, let me just quickly uh, say that 
there are many issues to be addressed. And I'm tired of talking about Donald Trump and his financial worries. Oh, I forgot to say, hmm. everybody should support the Nikki Maduro program. <laughs> Obviously, and I'm going to yes. tell you, do not support Donald Trump. Why? Financially. Because what he wants is your money yep. to pay off his legal bills. Can you imagine yes. contributing to his political pack? He has already spent $50 million on legal fees. You know, I remember when he came down that uh, that golden escalator, escalator and said, yeah. I can pay for everything. I right. won't need to ask you for money. Are we suckers? Yeah. And then that's not that's me, though. Yeah. yeah. By the way, I, you notice on the fundraising that uh, at this point, Joe Biden is so far ahead of yeah. Donald Trump in fundraising. The Democrats are going to have a, a heck of an arsenal. But don't forget to support the Mickey Maduro, Maduro program because, yes. well, you have to do that, too. <laughs> exactly. I'm not Donald Trump. I'm better than that. Uh, but on RFK Jr., and even this idea of having somebody else on the ballot, we saw also this week that Senator Bob Menendez says he won't run for the Democratic Party for the Senate, but he may In New run. Jersey. Right. But he may run as an independent. Can we talk about this idea of the independent, the no, what is it, the no party uh, moniker yeah. in this specific election? Do Are you worried about a spoiler? I'm always worried about a spoiler. Uh, no party has uh, no labels is what it's called. No labels. That's uh, what it was They like, have a yeah. problem. And the problem is they have to have a presidential candidate. They are now seeking a presidential candidate. Nikki Haley has said she won't run. Now, the other day, Chris Christie indicated he was thinking about it, but not if Donald Trump would benefit from it because he's committed right. to keeping Trump out of the White House. So let me be clear. Voting for a third party makes no sense. The last third party candidate for president to win an election uh, nationally was Abraham Lincoln in 1860. It's not going to happen, which means when Bobby Kennedy Jr., for instance, talks about potential running mates, look at the people he's talking about. It's a joke. It's it's ludicrous. And he, of all people, should know better because remember, his uncle, John F. Kennedy, chose Lyndon Johnson, who his father, Bobby Kennedy, opposed uh, for the nomination for vice president to back in 1960, didn't want him selected. Who is vice president matters. It has a huge impact. And I think this is something else that people better consider. But no labels concerns me. I understand what they wanted to accomplish, but unless you have a party leadership yeah. based on people who are serious contenders for the presidency, there's no way. So I'm hoping that it is a two-person race. Oh, you all have the Jill Steins and the others who get on the ballot in some states. I just hope they're not spoilers. Yeah. Uh, and what Chris Christie said needs to be understood. He said, I'm not going to run for president on no labels if I'm going to be a spoiler who will put Donald Trump back in the White House. And three cheers for Chris Christie for saying that. OCB is saying, if RFK is so crazy, why can't Biden beat his votes? Can you explain for people that may not fully understand the idea of a spoiler that it doesn't take too much. I mean, it does, but I mean, in our electoral system, what do we keep hearing this election? It's going to come down to a handful of these states where it really truly matters of getting people out to vote. People believe that Robert Kennedy Jr. is Robert F. Kennedy, the man who many of us admired and respected right. and who was assassinated in 1968. I will never forget working in Wisconsin for Richard Nixon in 1968 and Joseph McCarthy, uh, was the senator uh, from uh, Wisconsin. He died in 1957. But there were McCarthy buttons all over the place. And there was one woman who came up to me and I said, well, you're voting for McCarthy? <laughs> she said, you bet. I voted for old Joe all those years. I'm going to vote for him again. Uh, and It may sound silly, but a lot of people think by voting for Robert Kennedy Jr., they're really voting for Robert Kennedy, who yeah. was an icon in American politics. By the way, Joe Biden has his his statue, if you will, in the Oval Office, whenever Biden speaks from the Oval Office, you can see that image of, uh, of Bobby Kennedy. Uh, the American people have to be smart enough to understand that Bobby Kennedy Jr. is not his father. So in saying this, uh, I just hope the American people understand it. But more than that, if Bobby Kennedy Jr. does get on the ballot in 8, 10, 12, whatever the number of states, there will be a massive campaign to expose who he is. Yeah. Let me also remind you, George Wallace, back in 1968, had 20% of the vote coming into September. When he chose bombs away Curtis LeMay as his running mate, he sank to 9% of the vote. Uh, and 
I think if Bobby Kennedy Jr. isn't careful, if he chooses somebody truly, uh, and he's talking about all kinds of people, but it's crazy. Uh, you have to have a vice president who's prepared to be president of the United States. And uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr. isn't doing that. So we'll see what happens with no labels. We will know, by the way, Bobby Kennedy Jr., by the, by the time I appear on this show next week, he will have announced his running mate. Uh, and he's going to do it here in California. Right. Uh, we will know what no labels is doing more clearly. All of these play in. You just never know. You know what I love about politics, Nikki? What do you love? Every day politics? is something new. <laughs> Every, it's, it's better than it a soap. It gives me agita. You know what I mean, John? It's just It kind of just makes me worried, but I try to just breathe and then listen to you, and then it sort of makes sense of the craziness we live in. What's coming up on your podcast? Well, today I talk about the Middle East. Mm. And the reason I talked about the Middle East is because, as you know, this morning, the United States uh, offered a resolution uh, to have a ceasefire with the condition that Hamas be condemned, that the hostages be released, that humanitarian aid go in. And who was it vetoed by? Russia and China. Uh, and now, let me explain to you, Russia and China have uh, a nefarious agenda. They've made that clear over the years. They certainly are not willing uh, to concede that Hamas did a terrible thing, that Israeli hostages and Jews should be released. It's a serious problem. Uh, I want to commend Gavin Newsom, who called for a ceasefire along the lines of the UN resolution. And the simple fact is, there's only one issue which remains to be resolved. And that is, will the world ultimately condemn Hamas and insist on the release of the hostages? And let me draw an analogy with Ukraine. Here is the United Nations talking about Gaza, which is legitimate. Where is the condemnation of what's happening in Ukraine? Yeah. Uh, and you understand that's a human disaster uh, that is beyond comprehension. And let me point out to you, Russia and China, who are allies, again, could veto any such resolution, which is why no resolution comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my... One of the books that I had the pleasure of participating in is the biography of Harold E. Stassen. Governor Stassen was the real author of the Charter of the United Nations. If Governor Stassen were alive today, he'd be rolling over in his grave at the impotence of the United Nations. It's one of the real tragedies of this generation that we have failed in the dream. When the San Francisco Conference convened in 1945, it was to put an end to war. And uh, unfortunately, that dream has not been realized. Yeah. Check out his newest podcast, Around the Political World with John Rothman. You can find the link in the show notes. You, also, you can also find it on YouTube as well. John, we always appreciate your insight. Have a fabulous weekend. Nikki, we'll see you next week. anytime, <laughs> I'm always available to I you. I love you. But I want you to wish your daughter our warmest good wishes. Thank and you. ladies and gentlemen, if you want to make a difference in the world, contribute to the Nikki Maduro program and uh, tell your daughter we send her warmest good wishes. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Have a good weekend. Talk to you, you next too. week. Bye -bye. That, of course, is John Rothman. Let's welcome Kim McAllister to the show. Hello, my friend. Hello, girlfriend. How are you? I am doing well. I am doing well. And I'm so thankful to you for filling in for me yesterday. I was oh letting everybody gosh, know. Um, you know, things looked good for my daughter. You know, she's going to be dealing with us for the rest of her life, of course. Yeah. It's, it, it's one of those things. But Hell, I will take good news where I can find it. I will um, take it too. That's what we want. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay. So we're going to do some headlines. I am assuming that you know the big headline with Oakland. No, you don't. Did you what? not see it? What are you talking about? You haven't heard the huge news of Oakland? <laughs> <laughs> are you kidding with me? I want to play. Can before we, we do, we before got a new we police do, chief. I, I, I think is that what you're yes, talking about? Exactly. Because I, I got another story from Oakland where this. Let's just see the one where this poor little old man Aww. is being told you got to remove the graffiti from your fence or else. But he didn't do it. I know. <laughs> all right. Well, we're going to talk about all of that. I just want to play a little bit before your headlines. Sure. Of Shang Tao making this announcement on X. Now, this is a long, it's like six minutes. I'm going to jump. I'm just going to open it up, and then I'm going to go to her her announcement. And I just, I feel like, come on, Shang. Like, let's not act like you weren't part of the problem here. My fellow Oaklanders. Oh, my fellow Oaklanders. Over the past year, my administration diligently focused on diagnosing our city's challenges. Too long. While charting a path that leads to a more safe, clean, and prosperous Oakland. Hmm. Last October, during my State of the City address, I said, that public safety is my top priority. And yet it took you how and long? that remains true today <laughs> as we tackle Oakland's most pressing challenges. Mm -hmm. 
Oakland was once a national model for reducing gun violence, achieving a 50% decrease between 2012 and 2019. And yet. But as a city, we lost our way and stopped focusing on the proven violence prevention strategies we know work. Since 2019, violent crime has been on the rise and our police force yep. fell to dangerously low levels. Predictably, an increase in property crimes also followed. So problems, 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 and yet it still took you way too long. So finally, here's her <laughs> announcement. After an extensive process that included community, youth, and city leadership, I have selected Chief Floyd Mitchell. Chief Mitchell is a strong leader, a smart crime fighter who delivers results. Mm. His commitment to proven crime reduction strategies, including proactive policing and strong officer community engagement, bolted him to the top of the list. As our city's top police officer, Chief Mitchell will join the talented public safety leadership team we have assembled and lead the law enforcement elements of Oakland's comprehensive public safety strategy. Chief Mitchell is a veteran of the United States Air Force and began his career as a patrol officer with the Kansas City, Missouri Police. All right, and we're gonna learn more about him. Next week, there's gonna be even more. Uh, now, as far as uh, Mitchell, Chief Mitchell, now he, his department was flagged for issues with its 911 system. Does that ring a bell? So did Oakland. <laughs> <laughs> OK, abandoned 911 calls doubled in two years to 30,000 in 2022 out of a total of 183,000 calls. That means more than 16 percent of 911 callers hung up because the, the call wasn't being answered. Um, Mitchell said he didn't pay close attention to the matter because he was focusing more on how quickly answered calls were dispatched. And he says in hindsight, he should have paid close attention. Now, I'm being a little bit sarcastic here because obviously it's quite interesting that somebody that had problems with 911 calls is moving to a city to lead a department that has problems with its 911 calls. But he was quoted in, this, in the Chronicle as saying, you know, I've learned from this. Um, obviously, I'm going to take what I've learned and bring it to Oakland. I'm happy they have a police chief. I wish him the best of luck, but um, it's going to be it's going to be a tall hill for the poor guy <laughs> to climb because people want results and they want them now. So we shall see. We shall see if uh, if, if he's successful and how this relationship with not only the department. But the rest of Oakland is going to be because remember, a lot of people in Oakland wanted Laurent Armstrong. That wasn't going to happen, obviously, although he's suing the city, which means they might have to pay out again because you remember Ann Kirkpatrick also was paid out. Uh, so, yeah, we don't have a very good track record in Oakland with police chiefs. They have had, what is it, 12, 12 police chiefs in the past two decades? Oh, man, that's That horrible. is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> 12 in mm. 20 years is a lot of different police chiefs. So kind of, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'd want that job, but apparently we will. Oh, and Mike, yes. Uh, I thought Nikki was talking about Oakland University and Michigan beating Kentucky in the March Madness tournament. Oakland was what, 14th? And I think they beat a three seed. I could be wrong about that. I'm not watching basketball, but I saw that headline. So um, yeah, good on Oakland. All right, you guys, let's do some headlines. When we, we'll talk about a bunch of other stuff as well. Please click the thumbs up button to show your support for the show. And here's Kim. Now from around the world to up your street, the Nikki Maduro Show presents new czar Kim McAllister. Well, guess where we're going? Straight to the Capitol, because there's a lot going on here this morning. The House is approving a $1 trillion government spending bill. The bill passed 286 to 134 this morning in the House. Now, the Senate will take up the measure, trying to avoid this partial shutdown by midnight tonight. Good job waiting until the last minute, guys. That's a thumbs up. The package includes funding for the Departments of Defense, Homeland Security, Labor, Health and Human Services, as well as general government operations. Guess who didn't like that? Mm -hmm, Georgia exactly. Republican Marjorie Taylor Greene. And now, because of that, 
She is pushing to kick Speaker Mike Johnson out of power. Green filing a motion to vacate Johnson from the speakership over his support of the uh, more than trillion dollar government spending bill. Green and a group of conservatives are opposed to the bill due to a lack of spending cuts. Green this morning accusing Johnson of giving a little bit too much to Democrats during negotiations here. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you're shaking up your party. I don't know if that's what you want to do. No. Because it makes you guys look like you just can't get it together. Do you think she wants to be speaker? It can't possibly be that. I mean. God, what a nightmare. They just keep proving how dysfunctional (laughs) they are. Can you imagine her in power? Oh, my God. Like the nutso that would come out of her, spew out of her face. Although. uh, Johnson's nutty enough already with his whole, like, religion to the extreme degree. But, but don't her. you think that Ooh, she would girl. learn a lesson? Like, part of me, like, no, I don't want her to be speaker. I'm not saying that. But at the mm-hmm. other, on the other hand, like, when people get in, they're like, oh, we should be doing this. It's so, it's not easy to get mm-hmm. a consensus, especially when you're badass crazy. So, uh, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. Well, who knows? This party <laughs> never ceases to amaze. I used to work with this PTA president that said, Whenever someone would complain, she'd say, hey, listen, we didn't have enough help this year. And we would love it if you stepped forward and took the mantle and, you know, helped us out. So oh, next year, yeah. would you be interested in organizing? No. <laughs> <laughs> like it, it, It's an S job, but somebody has to do it. Do you want it? It's like when somebody says, oh, my God, this is so gross. Taste it. You're like, nah. I'm no. Gonna, thanks. thanks. No. The U.N. Security Council will vote on a U.S.-sponsored Gaza ceasefire resolution today. The resolution warns against an Israeli military offensive in Rafah and strongly condemns restrictions that prevent aid from entering the Gaza Strip. The resolution also calls for an immediate ceasefire in Israel's war against the Palestinian militant group Hamas without a time limit, and it condemns all acts of terrorism, including the Hamas-led attacks on October 7th. So again, that is what is up for vote with the U.N. Security Uh, Council uh, ceasefire resolution today. They found a body Mm. in this sad case. The body of a missing University of Missouri student has been found in a Nashville river. Police confirming the body found in the Cumberland River this morning is Riley Strain. The 22-year-old had not been seen since March 8th when he was asked to leave Luke Bryan's downtown Nashville bar. Police say there were no signs of foul play related uh, trauma on the body. So this investigation continues. Oh, that's so sad. It really is. The fire, and by the way, Deidre is listening to us Mm. on the plane. She said the plane has Starlink. She's on the way to Maui. Okay. Oh, hi, Deidre. She's listening to us, and I just love that we're going to Maui with her right now. This is I love that. Oh, can you just really take me next time? Okay. Exactly. But we're going along for the ride with her right now. Some people living downwind of the burn zone in Lahaina, Maui, are reporting respiratory issues. The American Ugh. Lung Association says last week they got a few calls from people concerned about dust and air quality, some reporting symptoms like a chronic cough. Three months ago, the Hawaii Department of Health urged West Maui residents to avoid all direct exposure to fire debris. Oh. And it looks like some people affected. Yeah, it doesn't. I mean, obviously, that doesn't surprise me, mm. though. You know, that, that's what happens. Yeah. yeah. And here as he is, you here mentioned it earlier, Oakland Mayor Sheng Tao officially naming Floyd Mitchell as the city's next police chief. Mitchell served with the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department for 25 years. He was the first black police chief in Lubbock, Texas, where he worked for four years. He resigned there in 2023. He says, uh, Chief Mitchell, I'm excited about the opportunity to meet the members of the police department, interact with all of the people who call this beautiful city home, and and become an integral part of this special place. Hold on, hold on. He kind of okay. Maybe I'm maybe I, now that I've brought up the picture, I'm like maybe not. But he kind of looks like this actor that that sadly passed away. Oh. Doesn't he kind of look? And he used to uh, he used to play a police officer. Doesn't he kind of look like this? Oh, dude? Andre Brower. Uh, no, his name is Lance Reddick. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, Lance Reddick. He kind of looks like him. No, maybe I'm stretching a little bit. Hold hmm. on. There's the other picture. Of the, oh, there he is. Okay, so we go from him to him. Kind of. I don't know. He's not a bad looking dude. But uh, oh. yeah, it'll be the police chief. Sorry. You have a very hard job to ask you. Good luck. Good luck in Oakland. <laughs> so why don't you start on Hagenberger? <laughs> exactly.
exactly. <laughs> Work is starting on transforming California's behavioral health care system. Governor Gavin Newsom was in Los Angeles yesterday celebrating the historic passage of Prop 1. He says treatment centers will prioritize mental health and substance use support like never before. The Department of Health Care Services will now create guidance for counties and give them time to meet the requirements. So mm. this after Prop 1 officially passed. Yeah, took a I while mean, it, to it, figure that it, one like, out. By its mm. teeth. So let's not do a big old pomp and circumstance for this Newsom. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I would not say that this was, you know, a, a huge, uh, all Californians supported it. But again, low voter turnout. And this is what happens. Not that I, I, you know, I've, I supported, I voted for Prop 1, just mm -hmm. full disclosure. But I, you know, him coming out, this is going to be great. Californians really called for it. Mm, not all of them. Yeah. No. Um, the horrible accident in San Francisco. Oh, I know. I hate this story. There's another I update. hate this story. I know. It kind of ends up with a little bit of a positive note, if yeah. you could say that. Right. This um, update and this crash that killed an entire family at a San Francisco bus stop. Relatives said in a statement that they are moved by the outpouring of love and grief from all over the world. They issued a statement yesterday thanking everyone who responded Saturday when that SUV slammed into two parents and their two little boys, mm. um, I think six months old and one year old. The oh, the baby was the only survivor but died on Wednesday. Yeah. His relatives called him a hero since his organs were donated mm. to save other children. Mm. They say the love the family showed to those around them will serve as their legacy. As for the 78-year-old driver, she's out of the hospital after being released from police custody. No word yet on whether she'll face charges, but the investigation continues as to what happened there. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I was I was debating this with my husband. He's like, you know, accidents happen. And I'm like, an entire family was killed. Like, yeah. I understand. I you know, but she was what? As far as I, I remember, she was speeding and driving the wrong way, right? So mm -hmm. what was going on there? What what was she thinking? And I'm sorry, there has to be a consequence. I know she's 78 years old and she, I would hope, didn't mean it. But four people, including two babies, lost their lives. You have to be held responsible for that. I just don't feel comfortable being like, eh, she didn't mean it. Like, I would be so devastated. I And I, this isn't a comfort and maybe many of you will disagree, but I'm kind of glad the whole family went together. I can't imagine just being... Although I wish the babies would have lived. Like, I don't know. Yeah. It's just, I can't, I just, this is literally awful. It, it It's absolutely awful. I guess the, the question is, is, was she drunk? Was right. it an accident? And is society served somehow by her going to prison? You, you know? know, people make mistakes all the time, Kim, and are thrown in jail or prison. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, you killed an entire family. You have to do sometime i'm not saying throw away the key on the woman you know what i mean but at the same time like we're we're then deciding uh, by what looking at her and, and and being like oh she didn't mean it that she doesn't have to be punished like somebody else that mm -hmm. probably didn't mean it when they cause an accident and somebody dies does go to prison i don't know it's a hard it's a hard call but i think she should face charges absolutely sorry mm. sad but i mean think of how many other children that baby saved so yes i get that and, and that is a that is a that is a bonus of you know a bonus yeah. of, of something good i guess a, a silver, silver lining, lining. Is what yeah. I meant to say, yeah we are going back to oakland <laughs> this oakland man <laughs> about to turn 103 Jesus. claims that the city's efforts to fight graffiti are not working he got a violation citation to clean up his back fence by this week or face an 1100 dollars fine Here's a guy in a wheelchair being told you got to get out there and clean up this graffiti on your back fence or you oh. have to pay a thousands of dollars. He says the graffiti keeps happening and that he used to paint over it himself every time before he used a wheelchair. And now it's hard to get out there and do it. His 70 year old son does it now, but he says the fix won't last. No. The city inspector reportedly plans to do an inspection, may cancel the citation. We'll see. I would hope so. It seems really unreasonable. And have you seen all of the graffiti around Oakland? Are you yeah. telling me you're, cit you're citing everyone involved? This is the number one spot that you're going for now. Please. There was, in my, in my old neighborhood, there was this fence that 
it it was like the boards were missing and they fixed it really terribly. Like they kind of did it crisscross and it looked terrible. And then it got some graffiti on it. And I would constantly report the graffiti, but the city of San Jose comes out it, it, if it's on, you know, the public side mm -hmm. and they paint over it. Um, now if it's at somebody's house, but this kind of looks like, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's the outside of his house. Correct. So it's the back fence, the outside of his back fence. Back fence. Yeah. I mean, this is not top priority number one. You know what I mean? And he's 103. I'm hoping the public the public comes in and and steps up. But yeah, exactly. Mindy, arrest the graffiti artist. Stop going Thank after you. this dude as the criminal and 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 get your graffiti task force in order and make something happen. Jesus. Come on. This poor guy. Yeah, exactly. Not cool at all. No, not at all. Well, California <laughs> is on the verge of extending the deadline to apply yeah. for college financial aid. Lawmakers passing a bill yesterday, sending it to Governor Newsom's desk. If he signs it, students will get an extra month to qualify for programs like the Cal Grant. Many have reported problems this year since the new system for the free application for federal student aid, known as FAFSA, was rolled out three months late. Yeah, so, it was. It, yeah, That's remember so we had somebody on talking mm -hmm. about the FAFSA. It was just, you know, whenever something new is rolled out, it's supposed to make it easier. It never is. Mm -hmm. So uh, my heart goes out. I've seen, you know, in my parenting groups and parents are freaking out. It's like I was told to get it in early and I haven't done this and I haven't mm -hmm. heard that. It's And then this is for state schools. So it's just really um, it's a scary time when you really need this this aid and everyone has to fill out the FAFSA. Like mm -hmm. no matter what you're doing with college, no matter if your parents are paying the whole thing and they don't need it, everybody in high school fills out the FAFSA. So I can only yeah. imagine the S show it is with all of these applications coming in. Yesterday, we talked a little bit about this on the, uh, the Nikki Maduro show. Mm -hmm. And now there's even more to talk about because State Farm is not renewing 72,000 policies in California. Wow. State Farm plans to non-renew 30,000 property insurance and 4,200 commercial apartment policies in California. They announced this on um, Wednesday. They say it will impact 2% of their total policies in California and that they're doing this to ensure their long-term sustainability. Mm. The 4,200 commercial apartment non-renewals, that's a complete withdrawal from the commercial apartment market in California. The other 30,000 non-renewals will impact homeowners, rental uh, dwellings, and other uh, property insurance policies, that according to State Farm. And this announcement applies to California only. The company said those impacted will be notified between July 3rd and August 20th. Yeah. So we know yeah. it's coming, right? Exactly. This is horrible. It is horrible. And I can't imagine living in some of these, especially these wildfire prone mm -hmm. areas. And I can't imagine doing the things needed. Um, and I know somebody had said, you know, wildfires don't care about, you know, <laughs> that fireproofing you've done around your home. Mm -hmm. But I would say, I would argue in some cases, yes. How many yeah. times have we seen, you know, a neighborhood go up and then the house that had the fireproofing and the distance and even, you know, water that sprays on their homes being saved there are things you can do to at least reduce right. the risk of your house being you know totally destroyed but they're not even giving any benefit to that they're just up and leaving and that's awful no yeah that's it and we talked yesterday we i read a story about these people in um santa rosa mm -hmm. that they got their insurance canceled right and they can't, they've been rejected by like 157 companies. Wow. They can't find insurance and they have to have insurance because their mortgage requires it. Of course. Right? And so are they going to lose their house? Well, they do. We that. don't know. This, well, the state of California has the yeah. insurance of last resort, which is expensive. It's like mm -hmm. Cobra. If you know a Cobra with health insurance, right? Yeah. It's very, very expensive and it's not supposed to be the only option for you and for many people it's it's becoming that so yeah state farms i understand the business aspect of it but they should work with people you know i think this is a great incentive for people mm -hmm. to fireproof their homes get that defensible space is it going to be a 100 percent no but then if people are doing this on their own and paying for it, it reduces the cost on the state, right? Because then mm -hmm. they don't have to go out and, well, obviously, if the wildfire destroys your home, that's the highest cost. But get people to do it on their own and give them an incentive of, A, you get homeowner's insurance at all. But, two, it, it should hopefully reduce your rates. I mean, come on. I'm reminded of that, and we've seen this before in other fires, 
But remember that building, that one building at the harbor in Lahaina with that had just been redone. They just yeah. put a new tile roof on it. They had painted it, so they cleared away all the brush and all the foliage from the home. And it's the only thing in that whole area that survived. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, God, can so, you imagine being that only building? You're like, oh, yeah. my God. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, we'll move on to this story. Oh, I put this in just for you because I mm. saw it last night. A person we used to work with found this on eBay and posted <gasps> it and said, hey, really? listen, there's a vintage KGO microphone for Look sale on eBay. That is cool. How much? They, they don't say how old it is. But look at the pictures. It's got on the side the old ABC because ABC is always used to always right. be connected. So it says ABC on the side, KGO on the front. It's a little worse for wear. Of course it is. It's for sale on eBay for four thousand dollars. Oh wow, that's way awesome. I'll it's a lot. Microphone. Yeah, that's can, a good piece of memorabilia, though. I hope somebody really gets is. it that actually worked there. But can you imagine how that old that old sound, that old yeah. timey radio like sound from the sixties or fifties? Crack open yeah. the mic. Crack Ex- open the mic. Crack is right. Man. That is really, cool. really cool. Yeah, Kim. That's cool and very expensive. I yeah. know, but I thought it was um interesting to look at at least. Yeah, and that's really I love yeah. I, I love those old timey microphones. I just adore them. They make them still that look, yeah. but it's not this is the real deal. That's the real you know deal. I mean? That's yeah. the real deal. How interesting. I mean, you wonder if it still works if they plugged it in. Apparently right. they don't name the person who worked there. That but they it. do they do say that um the the son of this person that worked at KGO is offering this for sale. Okay. Yeah. The son of the person that worked at KGO that mm-hmm. would have this. Right. So it was Does his, Lee Hammer it, have any sons? No. It was his <laughs> it was his dad's. No, I don't think it's Lee Hammer. But yeah, uh, it was, it belonged to the dad who has since passed, and they don't even say what year. So I don't know how old this thing is. I just well, the hand. Was... Well, the hand looked. It was a white hand, so you know we can kind of start narrowing things down. Mm-hmm. Um, interesting. Ron always doesn't have any sons. He has daughters, no. so Mm-mm. it wouldn't be Ron. Uh, I have a plastic mic fly too, Kim. Um, wow, that's pretty cool. That's pretty pretty cool. So yeah. anybody wants? Oh yeah. Blue Spark, it should be in the Bay Area Radio Museum. That'd be a really yeah. good thing for them to get mm-hmm. and display. That'd be awesome. That would be yeah. awesome. How cool is it. that? That's awesome. I know. I was looking at that last night thinking, oh, I got to show that to Nikki. That's, That's awesome. That's cool. That's really cool. <laughs> um, lastly, mm-hmm. Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire. Yay! And Tim Seek is, is going to be talking about it today, too. <laughs> the movie is off to a nice start at the box office. The sequel film made $4.7 million from Thursday previews yesterday. It's expected to make between 43 and 45 million dollars in its first weekend in theaters so there you go i love ghostbusters uh yeah my son looked at me yesterday he's like you want to go to the movies this weekend and i have my husband's company party tomorrow night i was like well maybe sunday although my daughter needs some clothes i'm like maybe i'm like i'm not going to promise that we can get to the movies and i was like why what's He's like, the new Ghostbusters is out. And oh. I was like, oh, sorry. Like, no, 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 no. Yeah, I know. I love Ghostbusters. Mm-hmm. So we'll see if Tim Seeker liked it um, because that's coming up. And do you want to know what else was released? And I'm yeah. not going to put it on the show because I'll get uh, flagged for it. But you can go on my Nikki Maduro show Facebook page. The new Beetlejuice trailer is out. Oh, yeah. I am so excited about that. So go check it out. You can Google it as well. Uh, I mean, Michael Keaton's in it. Um, Winona Ryder is in it. Oh, um, how am I? It's like the weekend of sequels. Yeah. But I mean, everyone's been waiting for Mm -hmm. Beetlejuice to come out for so, so long. I mean, they've done it. They've, they've teased it and created fake trailers and the girl from Wednesday, she's also in it. I think she plays Winona Ryder's daughter. Oh, and I'm blanking on the woman. I can't believe it. Kev, uh, from home alone and from, uh, Schitt's Creek. Uh, how am I blanking oh, the on the mom? Her? Yeah, the mom. What's her name? I can't I believe I'm forgetting know. her name right now. Three. Come on. Who's? I know the juice is loose. You're absolutely right. Come on. What's her name? I'm so mad at myself. Come on, guys. Uh, 
No, it's oh, Catherine O'Hara. Thank you, Catherine O'Hara. I needed yeah. it. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Catherine O'Hara is in it as well. So very excited about all of that. I don't know if Alec Baldwin or uh, Gina Davis are going to be in it. That would be fun, right? Yeah. So um, I don't know. If Gina Alec Davis. Baldwin... Do, I don't think she's done something uh, movie in a while. Gina Davis has been doing stuff, though, but it might be TV, I feel hmm, like. Okay. But anyways, um, all right, that is our news with Kim McAllister. It is. Um, the news is crowdfunded. The show is. is crowdfunded. Find us at thenickymadoroshow.com, where you'll find the Patreon and the PayPal links. Of course, the Super Chat Super Sticker is open for business. We're kicking it wide open. So thank <laughs> you for all the ways you support the show. I'm Kim McAllister on the Nikki Maduro Show. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and Spencer, thanks for the $5 and Blue Spark for the $10. Thank you, guys so much we we really do depend on all of your help and yes Catherine O'Hara how did I blank on that amazing actress's name I'm, I'm mad at myself um okay well there's some people that are mad that how the rich shop um I I've heard of this I would never in a million years even want one let alone buy one but the Birkin bag by Hermes uh, mm -hmm. Apparently, all of us poor people, Kim McAllister, uh, should have an equal shot at getting them. Now, do you know how expensive those are? They are like a hundred, over a hundred thousand dollars for a bag. You can get one for thirty grand. I was looking at the story last oh, night. Oh, really? You can get one for thirty thousand dollars. It just depends. Yeah, on which bag you're offered. Well, they and, can go for over a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, they can. They're yeah, they're named after the imagine? late actress Jane Birkin. Um, here's an image, and now again. They're, they, uh, they've lost an antitrust suit. This was the thing. Okay, hold on. This was what they were doing. So if you wanted to buy a Birkin bag, you had to buy other Birkin stuff before. So you had to have kind of like um, a resume of buying Birkin. So there it is. I am so sorry. There is no effing way. It's pretty, I guess. There's no sort of reality in which I wouldn't even spend $30,000 on a Birkin bag. So apparently it was being sued that it uh, would only sell its Birkin bags to customers with a quote unquote sufficient purchase history. Mm. So basically you had to buy shoes or scarves or belts or jewelry, the home goods. A pair, and also um, they would not allow you, like you can go in there and say, I just want a Birkin bag. And they'd be like, nope, sorry, we're not going to sell it to you, which is quite a business strategy, right? It's you have to be a good customer first. And so one or two plaintiffs, plaintiffs named in the suit who already spent tens of thousands of dollars at Hermes was coerced into purchasing ancillary products in order to obtain the Birkin bag. Ugh. As a result, she was unable to purchase another Birkin handbag in September of 2022. Like, oh, shucks, I can't buy two. Uh, the other plaintiff made multiple attempts to purchase a Birkin bag and was told on each occasion he needed to purchase other items and accessories and was unable to buy it. I cannot imagine. Apparently, there was an episode in Sex and the City that just kind of brought this to the head. Apparently, was... the, the character Samantha tried to buy mm. or try to use Lucy Liu's name to skip the five year wait list oh my to buy God. the Birkin bag. There was a Birkin bag episode in Gilmore Girls, too. Wasn't it that, yeah, um, uh, Rory got it and yeah, she put like random, one. random mm -hmm. stuff in it. And he's like, that's a Birkin bag. And she's like, oh, okay. She's like, put gum or some crap in it. No like, idea what it is. No idea what it is. And that's how I would react. If you didn't tell me it was a Birkin bag and handed it to me as if I should know these things, I would not know these things. I mean, it, it boggles my mind that someone would pay $100,000 for a purse. Yeah. I, I can't. I, I've been wasteful. using a, a fanny pack like forever God. right now because I'm like not wanting to even carry a bag. Like I just, and again, I understand people that can afford it. If you can afford it, that's fine. I'm not knocking you. If that's what you choose to spend your money on, it seems wasteful though. Um, Heidi says when the Birkin bags first came out in the 80s, they were only $2,000. That still seems like too much money for me. I'm sorry. Lori says, why would they want to publicize their stupidity by suing? I, I feel like they're not very, um, I'm not, maybe it's just me. Right. I, I don't feel bad for them. You're going to sue because you can't buy a Birkin bag? Well, I think, I think it's the antitrust um, thing. It's it's like th that, mm. that 
business shouldn't be run this way. It's kind of um, sort of like what what's happening with Apple, right? Apple is being sued because they're creating this ecosystem that we talk about all the time where they're able to charge so much money mm -hmm. because they lock people in, right? Uh, I mean, it's not exactly the same way, but it's the way they run their business. Randy says, I also see a used Birkin bag being offered someplace for half a million dollars. Can you imagine? No. There are so many other things I would do without an amount of money. Yeah, exactly. Red. People don't have housing, food, and other people are spending $30,000 for a purse. Yeah. Inflation, people. The economy is so bad. You know, it's, I mean, it's, they're doing you a favor by not letting you buy the purse. They're like preventing you from being really stupid. Yeah. And did you know that at, at Hermes, store sales associates, they only earn commission. This is another way they screw you, though. If you work for them, you only earn commission on shoes, scarves, belts, jewelry, and home goods and non-Birkin bags. But if you sell a Birkin bag, you'd get zero commission. Wow. Zero. It's so stupid. So in, I think in this article a little further down, I was reading it last night, too. Yeah. And it says this, when this clerk... Uh -huh. offers you a Birkin bag. They will only offer you one Birkin bag, not the color you want, not the oh, size you want, that. not the model you want. They will offer you whatever Birkin bag they offer you and you either can buy it or not buy it, <laughs> but they're not going to give you like access to the whole, you know, shelf you of Birkin choose. bags. You don't get to oh, choose. Oh, hell no. They present one to you and you're like, you either want it or you don't want it. And you're supposed to want it. I mean, because, oh, my God, you're going to have the opportunity to overspend on a purse to carry crap around. Like, And the purse has, like, um, gold or silver, real gold or silver clasps, sometimes encrusted with diamonds. Like, it's fancy. Nobody gives a crap. I don't Nobody care. Cares. If I saw a woman walking with that purse, well, one, I would not know that it was a Birkin bag. I would never know. I would mm -mm. never know. I know some people are like, that's a Birkin bag. Oh my God, you have a Birkin bag. Oh my God. No, I'm not that person. And I, mm -mm. I'm not, look, I'm not trying to knock people that do care about those things. I'm just happy. I don't. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I'm happy that I, I find no value in overvaluing something like a purse. I just, if that's what you choose to do and that's the that's the world you live in where those things matter, I'll, okay, that's the world you live in and that's why it matters. I'm glad I don't live in that world. I'm really glad I don't live in that world. Mm -hmm. Mama, three boys, I've been considering getting my very first real leather purse. Aww. My budget is $100. I love you. That would be some – that I respect. Yeah. You know, I want a leather purse. I want it to last a long time. I'm going to invest in something where it's not going to fall apart or the stitching is going to come out. But on the other hand, I'm going to keep it real and I'm going to spend only $100 on it because mm -hmm. that's normal. <laughs> like, like, okay, something Sorry. worth a value. It's it's stupid to spend way the, more than that. So I, I'm a fan of the the coach purse, the coach leather purse. Okay. And I must have had, I know this says a lot about me. I think I've had the same purse for 10 years. Oh, it's God, a, same. Just Mine a black apart. leather yeah. purse. But these coach purses, they, they were made by people who used to make baseball gloves, right? Oh, so okay. they're used to working with leather and, and sewing leather to stay together. And they're hardy and heavy duty. And this purse has lasted me. So I think I paid a couple hundred dollars for it 10 years ago. And I still have the same purse today. There I know go. I'm not so very fashion conscious. But hey, the purse works. It's not gross inside. So exactly. I'm going to keep using it until, you know, party's over. And even if it is gross inside, nobody sees that part anyway. I mean, I'm a mom. <laughs> so my purse is like the inside of it has some sort of candy probably stuck what to the, the bottom of it. in there? Yeah. Exactly. But my husband bought me a purse. Several years ago, I still have it. That's the purse that I would use if I was carrying a purse. But right now, I'm just using literal fanny packs because I love not mm -hmm. having a purse. Like, not that, in, but the funny part is I use it as like a crossbody thing. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. But it's a fanny pack. I'm, let's not fake the funk here. Let's stop. Yeah. Okay. Let's stop calling our crossbody things not a fanny pack just because we're not carrying it around our ass. All right. Like, it's a, it's a fanny pack. But, mm. That works for me. It keeps everything small and condensed. I'm not loading mm -hmm. it up with stuff. It carries my keys, my headphones, some chapstick, and my wallet. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's and we're leaving. We're leaving people. I want to be like a man who doesn't carry a purse and is able to have obviously not <laughs> totally die. I don't know why women need to carry so much stuff, but we do. I admit we mm -hmm. do. Liz says I have an yeah. old coach wallet. It's still in excellent condition. It's probably at least 20 years old. Uh one of my really good friends uh got me a coach. Um 
what do you call those? You know, the wristlets or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Uh, and I've had that. I have had that for years. Yeah. And it's well made. That's the thing. When you invest, I'm not saying there isn't a benefit of, you know, really investing in something that you're going to use every day, of course. But I am not paying thousands of dollars, Lorraine. I'd rather have the KGO microphone. <laughs> Me right? too, Lorraine. Exactly. Me too. I just, I, I feel like it's um, when you're spending $30,000 or more for something, it's more so other people know that you have it versus mm-hmm. it's a high quality. It's going to last because you can buy something at a lower price scale. That's very high quality. That's going to last a long time. So it, then it's just image and keeping up with the Joneses. And that is something that this woman is not doing. <laughs> Montreal, <laughs> all these purses are just a piece of a cow's ass. Exactly. But I mean, maybe it was a massaged ass. You know, you never know. Uh, Louis says, I know people that literally become good friends with salespeople at Hermes so that they get the latest info on what's coming into the store. But according to Kim, they don't even get their choice. It's like, I can imagine them like opening up the the box and like, this is what you have the honor of overspending on. Bite me. Yeah, Kim, if I'm paying 30,000, it's for a car that I would understand. And even $30,000 is kind of at my limit of what I want to spend on a car. Um, Cause it's just getting me from A to, A to B, you know, I'm just, I don't consider my, I mean, I do consider myself cheap in certain aspects. I will pay for something that's quality, but I will not overpay for a label. I'm just not going to do that. If it's not meant to be used every day, then what good is it? For for a hundred thirty thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, it should be opera. it should be a smart purse. It should do like all these. It should be self cleaning. You know right? what I mean? It should pay mm-hmm. my bills. It should do something more than just carry my crap around. It should tell me there's garbage in the bottom of your purse. Like it should, yes, you know, your lipstick cap is open. You know, right? the pen is leaking. Thank the pen you. Is leaking. Right. <laughs> It should have a function and a purpose. It's not used to be meant for every day. It's it's a it's a hundred thousand dollar purse Thank meant you. to be kept in its dust wrap in your closet. No. Well, that's not very that's useful. stupid. But mm-hmm. there are people that do that. They do that with shoes. They do that with bags. Right. Yeah. I mean, I buy things and I use them. If I'm buying something, I'm using it every day. If it's a purse, it's the purse. Like. I have, okay, I'm thinking of the purses that I still have. I have a pink purse that I got, I think, at like Marshalls or TJ Maxx or something. Mm -hmm. And it's cute, but it's a light colored pink purse. So it gets kind of dirty. And so, like, you know, I spot clean it, but I got over that. Then I have the purse that my husband got me. And I think that's it. And then I have my fanny packs. That's it. Uh, Mm -hmm. You can remodel your kitchen for $30,000. And I better get a better ROI on it. Eric says, I just checked, and the average cost of a new car is $48,000. Yeah. I mean, the next car I buy, I don't know if it's going to be brand spanking new. It might be, but uh, I'd have to pay pretty much close to cash for it. Well, it says it's meant to be seen with, for example, going out to lunch with fancy friends at the French laundry. I don't live in that world. Let me I don't get right on it. Yeah. I, I don't want to be, I, I don't find joy in sitting down for lunch with the ladies and then putting my purse on the table and all of them going, oh, is that a <laughs> That's not the world I want to live in. And I'm not no. knocking people that do live in that world. I don't want that to be a stress in my life mm-hmm. that I have to be like, oh, I have to, I, it's, it's a Birkin lunch. I hope the ladies notice. Thank you, Wes, for the $5 super sticker. You are awesome. Um, but yeah, like that's not, I don't want that to be a pressure in my life. I, yeah. I don't want that to be a desire. If it is for you, okay. If you find joy in that, okay. Mm-hmm. I just feel like there's, I have enough things to worry about. Yeah, exactly. Work. We've got Nothing. real things to, to got deal real with. Things to deal with. Yeah. I mean, does anybody really care what my purse looks like? I do have a friend who said, I think, Kim, that it's time for a new purse. Well, okay. Is it is it ratty or is it getting like mm-hmm. frayed or whatever? Y- you know how the straps sometimes can get a little yeah, raggedy? Yeah, yeah, from but where you're this holding is a it. purse who has always the newest purse in this, yeah. of the season. Don't listen and to I'm those like, people. Yeah. It works. It carries my stuff from point A to point B. I'm good to go. Exactly. Uh, Liz says there's a guy on YouTube that cuts up expensive bags such as Chanel and inspects the quality of the purse. Mm. I mean, I, I, I want to know, you know, how quickly, like Kim was talking about, how quickly is it going to fray on the strap that I have around my arm and my shoulder? Because that's mm-hmm. what happens, right? You're holding it and it rubs and, and yeah. the thread comes out, right? I want to know how deep it is. I want to know how many pockets it has. Does it fit my phone? Does it... Is it I'm like utility of it all? I'm like, is it easy to find things? Um, I don't know. Eric says this is not the show for the Birkin crowd. <laughs> yeah, I would love to know if anybody actually watches. Does if it is, really, you're probably any, not 
Probably not liking me very much right now, though. But... Do any of you have a Birkin bag? Let us know. We don't think so. It. We don't think don't you're think out there so. in the chat land. But no. Hey. But if you are, can you explain it to me? That's <laughs> like, funny. Uh, Ron says fully funded for 401k fully funded ladies. Yeah, right. Um, I don't know, man. Oh, the channel. If you want to see the guy uh, breaking up is breaking up the bags is Tanner Leatherstein. What a name. Mm. That's obviously not his real name. I mean, tanning leather, leather stein. I, I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. All right. Um, let's move on. If any of you do have a Birkin bag, though, you guys have to let me know. Really, you really, really, really do. Um, oh, let's actually keep this in the realm of money, though. Okay. Have you heard? And I'm gonna. I hope I don't butcher her name. Radajal Radajalski, Emily Radajalski. She's yeah. a supermodel. You've heard of her, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So she's getting divorced. She's 32 years old. She is, is divorcing film producer Sebastian Bear McClard. I bet they have broken bags. I would have kept the Radajowski name too. Right. Uh, they share a three-year-old son, but they are splitting. They split in, in September of 2022 after four years of marriage. Oh, darn it. I don't have the picture. Hold on. I got I to show you this picture because it's very important to the story. So she's getting divorced. Now, obviously, if you are a supermodel... <laughs> I'm sure that when a guy is proposing to you, it's the ring is going to be up there with Birkin bag costs, right? Probably bigger and, and right. more expensive. Well, they got split. They're splitting up. And so she has decided to make custom made, and here's a picture, divorce ring. So this apparently is her wedding set that she had. I mean, uh -huh. look at the rocks on the, on those rings. That's wow. too big for me. I, I, don't, I don't think that that's attractive at all. Again, mm -hmm. my opinion, my opinion. So she's making these divorce rings. Uh, they're from a high end jeweler who designed her custom, her original custom two stone diamond engagement ring that you see on the screen right there. The newly deconstructed rings feature the princess cut diamond flaked by trapezoid side stones as seen on her right ring finger on her pinky. She wears a similarly styled gold band with a giant pear diamond from the original engagement ring, which she got four months after her wedding in 2018. Both of the diamonds weigh over three carats each besides just being like, damn these rings. Would you wear or redesign the rings that were attached to a person you're not with anymore. No, isn't that bad juju? That's what I was thinking. Mm. Anybody divorced and 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 I guess I'm talking to women. I don't know how many men would most men wear a band, not, mm -hmm. you know, rocks like that. So any women out there do something with their wedding rings or engagement rings after you've been divorced. Because you... I feel like that's such bad juju. I would be hawking those things so quickly. Are you supposed to give it back? Hell, after you're married? I don't no. Know. Or is it just you give it back if you break an engagement? I don't I wouldn't give it back either way. Really? No. I They're mean, it, mine. It was a symbol of something that didn't happen. The symbol that you wanted to get married to me. Thank you for the ring. That's another great <laughs> question. Um, oh my god. And, you're and funny. thank you, Marilyn, for the five dollar super sticker. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Am I wrong here? You guys tell me. If you got engaged to a I woman. You give it back. That's you know the how, you, There's only one instance in which I would give it back. And that's if it was a family heirloom. Mm -hmm. That's the only way. But if you bought me an engagement ring and it's brand spanking new and you gave it to me, it's mine. It is no longer yours. Even if you just, if, if, if the ring. Am I wrong? I feel like yeah. everyone's judging me. Really? If, if the ring is a symbol of you're going to get married and you break that promise that you've made to someone, then you yes. give the ring back. Why? Because what are they going to do with it? They I, give it to the next girl or take oh, it, see if they can no. sell it or get their money back from it. I don't know, but, but I wouldn't feel comfortable keeping it. It doesn't, it's not. It is it, mine. The but Yeah, but the purpose for which the ring was given is gone. Okay, let me, let me, let's create scenarios here, my friend. What if you <laughs> gave me an, <laughs> what if you gave me an engagement ring and then you cheated on me? I have now, oh. I have to give you back the ring? Is mm. it, no. Uh, let's just say, you know, it's amicable and we break up, you know, like you gave me this ring. It's a good memory. Am I supposed to give back every gift you ever gave me on the hope that we would be married someday? No. Well, but the engagement ring comes along with a very specific purpose. 
And if the purpose is not being met, then the promise is broken and the promise of the ring is broken and that ring is it But why goes should back. I have to lose my ring that's mine because I'm wearing it because we decided I don't I don't agree. Luis agrees with you. She says, give it back if you break the engagement. Yeah. Eric says, I assume my ex's ring will be given to my son if and when he finds the person as in as it is an heirloom diamond. Now, if it's like my grandmother or this is my mother's ring, absolutely hand mm. that back. But if it's brand to it's brand new to you and it's brand new to me, guess who has it? Possession is what <laughs> three tenths of the law, whatever that, that quote is, right? Um no, I am I wrong? Yeah, you're petty and wrong. Why is it wrong for me to keep something that was given to me? Ricky says it was a gift. Yes. Karen agrees with me. You keep it. You earned it, baby. Yes. Liz, yes, it's yours, Nikki. I would not give it back. Okay, so it's like this. Okay. It's like um Hold on, hold on. Ethically, Kim, ethically you're supposed to give it back yeah. even if the guy cheats on your ass. Let's put it in perspective here. You usually break off engagements because something happened. And if it was the dude or the other person that gave the ring's fault, no way in hell am I giving you back that ring. No. So, okay. if I give you a really nice Le Creuset pot that cost me $300, right. and I get that for you because you just got married or you're getting married. Uh -huh. But then that's Emily Radich. I was, <laughs> I was like, damn. <laughs> then, then though, the day before the wedding, I get an email that says, wedding's off, canceled. Right. Does that mean you're going to keep the Lake Crusade pot that I sent yes. you? Or are you going to send it back because oh. you didn't get married? So oh, the wedding, wedding gift. gift. No, right. wedding gifts are different. Wedding gifts are different. I, I will give you that. But no, like, the engagement so same thing ring, with the engagement no, ring. It's not. It's a it's a no. gift for something that never happened. Now you could make the argument to me that they've been married for a certain number of years. So at that point, you know, the marriage happened. It becomes her ring. What have you? Maybe. I still think I'd give it back. Oh hell no! You are mm. insane. If I'm married to somebody I'm for insane. four years, <laughs> if I'm married to someone for four years and they look at me at the divorce and say, "Can I have the rings back?" I will be only putting up one finger, and you can guess which finger it is. It's not the ring finger. Okay, so no way am I giving back the ring. Kim says ethically, you're supposed to give it back if you were never married. Mm -hmm. But Kim said, but this woman obviously was married i i could never ask for it back but if you were if you ask me for my, my hand and you give me this ring it is no longer yours it is no longer yours um jim says nikki that's not right if you say yes to the wedding then you change your mind i mean i guess it matters the situation look if i am a man let's just do heteronormative okay if i'm a man and I spend buku bucks on an engagement ring, okay? And I ask this woman, she accepts. And then a few months down the line, I, I, I find out she's effing around on me, okay? I, I, I do, I would side with the guy and be like, you should try to get that ring back. But if I took it to court, I don't think a judge would say she has to give it back. So that's the point, right? Like you gave it to me. You willingly of your own volition gave it to me. I accepted it. There was nothing like if we now if there's a if there's paperwork, if maybe you spent a lot of money, you're like, look, if we don't get married though, you're gonna give me this back and had it in writing, okay, fine. But I don't think anyone's proposing that way. You're uh, giving and, me the ring as, and, as if I'm keeping it. An engagement ring is kind of in my mind like a verbal contract. And if the contract isn't fulfilled, then the item is no longer belongs to Ms. Nikki Verbal Maduro. contracts don't carry any weight. Don't you watch Judge Judy? You can take <laughs> you wipe your butt with a verbal contract. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. no, it's not. Exactly. <laughs> what Judge Judy decide? I just, um, <laughs> I am not a gold digger. I am just saying, like, unless there was some sort of sentimental value to the ring in which the giver has some sort of, you know, right mm -hmm. and history with this jewelry. Thank you for the nine tenths. It was nine tenths. Um, I, no, no, I'm, I'm not giving it back. I've never been in this situation. I hope that my children are never in this situation. But yeah, no, that ain't happening, my friend. Not okay, at all. So what about the drama? That whole moment where you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. And you slap the ring on the table and walk out. That's good. Then you've lost your <laughs> ring. Now you have done something that, that would show... 
verbally that you don't want it. If I was, if the woman takes off her ring willingly, gives it back to the man and then calls up and been like, Hey, I really want that back, that ring back. The guy can tell her to kick rocks with open shoes, open toes, right? Open shoes. Um, no, that's not going to happen. But if she keeps it on her finger and he's like, can I get the ring back? Then she has to decide. Now, is it a, kind of a bitchy move to say, no, I'm keeping it, even though I messed around on you. It's a great ring and I want to hawk it and make money. Yeah. But go to court and see what the judge says. And I bet you the judge is going to agree with me. I just do. Um, there's no, there's no legal basis to force somebody to give you back something that you willingly gave to them. That's it. So I'm sorry. And I know it's a promise. Look, guys, I'm not saying it's not mean. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, no, <laughs> you gave it. You spent way too much money on a ring if you if you can't willingly give it up. And that's it. And unless you're going to return it, you can't save it, right? I mean, we all agree you can't reuse an engagement ring. Haven't right? you seen them all for sale on Craigslist? Like, you can't do that. Anybody, anybody think it's okay to reuse an engagement ring? Because... As long as it's not the heirloom one. The heirloom one is in the category all its own. But you can't <laughs> buy a brand new spanking ring, ask somebody, get it back, and then ask somebody else at the ring. The ring is now jinxed. It needs to be cleansed. Get out your sage mm. and your crystals because that yeah. ring needs something before. It needs to change ownership, I would say. You can't um, use it again. I will say that my ring doesn't look like that. No. My if ring looks my like ring this. looked like that, I might have a little hard, more difficult time giving it back. Well, yours is pretty. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? I love my ring. Yeah. And uh, it's it's great. I haven't They're... worn mine, but it's, it's sitting here in my I office. I, I haven't worn it. it. That's awful. Yeah. Here's mine. It's not very big. <laughs> it's just a little tiny one. Mine's, it's mine's, okay. not, mine's not a carrot. Yeah. Or, you know, I like it. I have small yeah. hands. I don't, you know, if, if my husband hit the, if we hit the lottery this week and buy lottery, tic lottery tickets to people, um, if we hit the lottery, I still wouldn't want a bigger ring. I wouldn't. Yeah. I'm not that, I'm not a jewelry. I, I would love the opportunity to prove how non-superficial I am. Lottery gods, lottery gods. <laughs> but I just can't see myself going out, even if I won the lottery, buying Birkin bags and, and gaudy, gigantic diamond no. rings. I just can't see myself So doing I haven't worn my ring since it started scratching my infant, right? I was scratching oh, Julia with okay. it. So I, I took it off when I got pregnant. Then I put it back on after I had the baby. And then it was kind of, it was scratching her. So I took it off and I, I put it back in the box and then I just kind of stopped wearing it. And I, I don't do. feel sad terrible. about it at all. Oh, you're <laughs> oh no, I get mad. I've, I've shared the story before. Like, I, I always wear my ring. I don't take it off. Yeah. My husband has taken his off a, a couple of times. But it's missing stones. His mm. ring is a mess. And yeah. I've been trying to get him a new wedding ring. And he refuses. He's like, no, I do not this want is one. The I, ring. Like, I like my beat up wedding ring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, okay. He's I sweet. really, really, really. All James. right. Natalie's trying to go law on me. She says, sorry, Nikki, you're incorrect. Yeah. California Civil Code Section 1590. California Civil. Okay, let's look it up here. Civil Code 1590 says any jerk that's engaged to somebody. Okay. I seem to recall Judge Judy requiring the rings to go back. What, where either party to a co contemplated marriage in this state makes a gift of money or property to the other on the basis or assumption that a marriage will take place in the event that the done refuses to enter into the marriage as contemplated, that is given up by mutual consent. Doesn't the mutual <laughs> consent play a Nikki's huge like, factor I'm not in consenting. This? I'm not consenting. <laughs> I'm not consenting. There you go. Uh, I don't know if that necessarily proved me wrong. I am quite surprised the donor may recover such a gift or such part of its value under all circumstances. Um, but it's tricky to decipher as there are certain aspects of the rule that are not immediately obvious. First, note that the statute contemplates recovery of a gift. And a gift is a transfer of property without consideration. In other words, a gift is something given without any expectation of a return of payment or service. And this can be a difficult condition to satisfy by proof in court. Second, there is a question of what it means for the dunny to refuse to enter into the marriage as contemplated. Does this require a definitive statement? No. The breach of a marriage contract may be shown by any words or conduct, although there is neither verbal nor written refusal to marry. I'm sorry. I think that I, it's gross. I, I agree with you guys that, you know, it would be the nice thing to do to hand it back. But no, 
<laughs> especially if he cheated. If he cheated, he gets nothing, nothing at all. I mean, he might not want it, but if it was that ring, I don't know, man. I don't know. All right, let's do a few headlines because we have Tim Sika coming up in just a few minutes. I want to know what Tim Sika thinks, not about rings, but of course, the new blockbuster movie or Ghostbuster movie coming out. Mm -hmm. Also, and I saw this on Prime last night, but I went to work. I went to bed hella early last night. The new Roadhouse with Jake Gyllenhaal is out. Oh. I'm excited to hear what uh, Tim Sika thinks about that one. Uh, click the thumbs up button. Uh, thank you to uh, Marilyn, who gave, just gave a $5 super sticker. Wes hey. also with $5. Blue Spark came in with a $10 donation, and Spencer started us off with $5. Thank, thank you, you, thank guys. you, thank you, you yeah. guys. The super chat, of course, is always open, whether you're watching live or on replay. And here's Kim with some more headlines. Now, from around the world to up your street, the Nikki Maduro Show presents News Czar Kim McAllister. Oh, uh, there, there are three men under arrest in Southern California in connection with the theft of nearly $7 million worth of Bitcoin here in California. The Los Angeles Police Department says the men ran a cryptocurrency mining operation at an undisclosed location that consisted of more than 600 computers. I mean, this is a pretty sophisticated operation. $6.9 million worth of Bitcoin was recovered during the investigative operation which then led to all of these arrests. So that's so, just So, I mean, crazy. I'm assuming this was like a hacking thing because Bitcoin doesn't exist in physical form. So um, unless, of course, you cash it out for dollars. Well, they, um, were, mi they were mining Bitcoin. Yeah, so it was, it was that sort of thing. I don't Again, know. I always, Bitcoin, we talked about this before. It yeah. blows my mind that people are like, yes, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. I'm like, when you cash out your Bitcoin, what do you get? You get dollars. And why yeah. do you get dollars? Because that's what we use in this country for money. <laughs> What's your Bitcoin looking like today? Oh, let's let, let me check. Every let time we check. do a Bitcoin store, that's we got to check hold the Bitcoin. On, hold on, hold on. Let's see. The let's one tenth see. of a Bitcoin that you have. Oh, it went down a little bit. One thousand two hundred and sixty six. So is that a half a Bitcoin or what do you have there? I don't. OK, so I don't An know. An eighth how to, of a Bitcoin. It is. Hold on. My Bitcoin, my asset. Let's see. What do I have? I don't know how you. How do, a third how do of a Bitcoin? Something. I have, oh, I have, okay, here it is. This is what I own. I own 0 0.018642 Bitcoin. Oh, okay. 0 0.01. Well done. Actually, 0 0.02 if you round up the eight. So point Which you only paid 50 bucks for it. Yes. And now it's Back worth a thousand day. something. So yeah, you've done pretty well with the. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, state lawmakers are considering approving a special fund in Hawaii that would protect Hawaiian Electric and other utility companies from lawsuits related to the Maui wildfires. What? what? <laughs> <laughs> really? Uh, HECO, HECO, is facing potentially billions of dollars in damages following the fires. A measure proposed by HECO, of course, and now being debated by lawmakers, also calls for a billion-dollar fund to pay for damages from the mm -hmm. future fire catastrophe. The state wildfire fund would hold enough money to immediately pay for property damages after another fire. To qualify, the fire would have to damage 500 or more buildings. But they don't want to be sued for the billions of dollars in damages. So, mm, Of course they don't. I mean, you know what? Just because you don't want to be sued... Right. Hawaii uh, power taking lessons from PG and E. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, That's exactly look, right. Exactly. Come on now. More money is coming to California to tackle the Tijuana River sewage crisis. A new appropriations package secures $103 million to fix a San Diego treatment plant near the border and allow other federal agencies to contribute as well. It's described as an urgent, all-hands-on-deck effort. Governor Gavin Newsom calls it important progress, saying communities have been dealing with water pollution there for far too long. Yeah. There is a California museum that is opening uh, an exhibit today with a prehistoric sloth bone. Ooh, that's Experts cool. say it may be one of the largest fossils of the animal ever recovered. Students at an elementary school in Santa Cruz County actually found it while digging through the mud. They plan to go back and search for the rest of the skeleton, but for now, the sloth bone will be on display at the local Museum of Natural History through May in Santa Cruz County. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. I love a, a nice old sloth bone to get everyone to the museum, you know? 
Exactly. Speaking of which, my son is at the Sacramento Capitol today and then going to the gold country to sift for pan for gold. gold. Yeah. It's the gold. So it's, it's the fourth grade uh, uh, 49er, whatever. Field trip. Yeah. Field trip, my friend yeah. who's a teacher took her students and uh, mm. one of her children was part of the class that went and they just went yesterday. So this must be the week to be doing that sort of thing. Yeah. And it's good because rain is coming. So it's good that they're going today. Well, I think it's going to rain today. I had them in a little waterproof jacket. Yeah, but I don't think until later on. on. Hopefully, they'll be okay. Hopefully, they'll be okay. I hope so. Yeah. The Bay Bridge lights are a lot closer to turning on. They've been off for a year now, but organizers almost have enough money to bring those lights back and brighter than before as well. A fundraiser is only $250,000 away from its $11 million goal. I and love once, the lights. I love them too. Once the goal is reached, the project can begin to double the number of custom lights to 50,000 on both sides of the bay. It could be another year though before the famous display is ready again. Well, I hope that they're figuring out how to make them more durable because that was mm -hmm. also a huge cost for the for the light display is, you know, it's windy and the salt. And remember right. the artist that was behind it was saying it, it does. The upkeep is a huge cost. So I'm really right. hoping they have in some way figured that out. But that bridge is kind of cursed. So I can imagine <laughs> there being problems. Sorry. Liz. But driving down Broadway and seeing the lights of the Bay Bridge in the early I morning. I love it. It's so nice. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Three East Bay lakes are closed to swimming the first week of spring. Signs are up for people and pets, too, to stay out of Quarry Lake in Fremont, Del Val in Livermore, and Shadow Cliffs in Pre uh, Pleasanton. Why? Well, the water is said to be dangerous because of a bloom of toxic blue-green algae. You yeah. don't want to swim in that stuff. A less severe caution advisory has also been posted at Lake Temescal in Oakland, Lake Anza at Tilden Park in Berkeley, and Contra Loma Reservoir in Antioch. So beware. That's I just went what... to Del Val a couple years ago. Love that. It's really great. But yeah, yeah. Uh, don't go in the water if you're anywhere over there. It's bad. The Beverly Hills Mansion where the Menendez brothers shot their parents to death in 1989. It's on the market. It's been sold. <laughs> I knew it. Can you imagine I can living there? It. Like, no. <laughs> I mean, I'd be with, with Sage and get the priest I in there know. trying to get out the bad no. juju. You know, I love mm. my horror movies. This is how they all start. Just to let you guys know, like, yeah. this is how, you know, you get. The movie possessed. starts with a real estate agent. Exactly. And here in the living room is where two <laughs> people know. were b brutally bludgeoned. I mean, it is a piece of history. I, mm. I I, might make it like a tourist thing if I wanted to make money off the murder of two people. But yeah, no, that's I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Well, it sold for $17 million. So somebody <laughs> could do it and do it well. The $17 million sale closed Wednesday on the 28th anniversary of when a jury convicted oh. Eric and Lyle Menendez of murder. The seven-bedroom mansion had been on the market since December 1st. It was sold by telecommunications executive Sam DeLug, who bought the house in 2001. The new buyer's name has not been released. But um, I would be, I would feel all kinds of creeped out oh, living in that creepy, place. Weepy. I mean, I'm assuming it's been, obviously it's been cleaned mm. and things like that. Like you're not going to see blood everywhere, mm -hmm. obviously, but just the energy, I believe like <laughs> things get left behind, right? Like, no, I, at night, if I was by myself, no, no. No, thank you. No, thank you. Call the Ghostbusters. As... <laughs> speaking of, of which, well, actually speaking about Beetlejuice, which you mentioned earlier. Yes. The first trailer is being released for the long-awaited Beetlejuice sequel. Tim Burton's Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice sees Michael Keaton reprise his role as the title character, as well as Winona Ryder, known he's in there, Catherine O'Hara, representing their uh, roles from the first film, joining the cast, Jenna Ortega as Astrid Dietz, Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice hits the theaters on September 6th. It's so interesting how such a big to-do is just made out of a trailer for something. But I'm telling you, and yeah. Tim Seek is uh, going to join us in just a mm -hmm. second, but I'm telling you, they used to make fake trailers about a new Beetlejuice coming out. It's kind of like we were trying to make it happen, and now that it finally is, this I, I hope that it's going to be good. It's coming out in what you said, September, right? Mm -hmm. So 
I, I will be one of the first people to watch it. I love Beetlejuice. I love, I can still watch it today. It still holds up. And one of my first thoughts always is, is like, damn, that's Alec Baldwin. But uh, yeah, it's a really, really good, good movie. And I'm excited to see it again. Late night talk show host Seth Meyers is filming a new comedy special in Chicago. The stand-up set scheduled Saturday, June 15th at the Vic. Meyers' last comedy special, Lobby Baby, is currently streaming on Netflix. Nice. If you are looking for a cheap baseball game to go to, the Chicago White Sox apparently are the cheapest ticket in Major League Baseball. Mm, okay. That according to a new survey from bookies.com. <laughs> the website priced out the total cost to see a game this upcoming season. And for four tickets, parking, two beers, two sodas, and four hot dogs, the grand total is under $120. Wow. On the opposite side of town, the Chicago Cubs experience is among the top three most expensive in Major mm-hmm. League Baseball. So <laughs> keep that in mind. If you're yeah. Out there. Yikes. Uh, this report is crowdfunded, which means we re- rely on you to help us fund the Nikki Maduro show. The Nikki Maduro show.com is where you can find us online. The Patreon and PayPal links are also in the show description of this show here on YouTube. And again, the super chat, super stickers are open as well. So thank you for all the ways that you support the show. I'm Kim McAllister on the Nikki Maduro show. Thank you, Kim. All right. Uh, Just real quickly, in about 25 minutes or so, uh, just to put on your radar, Kim McAllister, uh, Huffington Post reporter, writer, Yasher Ali is reporting that U.S. networks will broadcast a special report on Kate Middleton's health at 2 Eastern, which is 11 hour time. Uh, No word on whether we're going to get a major update, but just keep your eye across the pond, as they say. All right, uh, let's welcome our friend Tim Sika. And Tim, I'm sure you heard us talking about it there. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice coming out in September. Are you excited about this real quickly? Yeah, uh, I, ah. you know what? I, 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 yeah, I won't hold my breath. I'm, yeah, I won't hold my breath. Let's just say that. You don't have very high hopes is what you're saying. Yeah, you know, it just seems too gimmicky to me. Like, they're just trying to cash in on something people love. I love the original Beetlejuice. It's like what you said about it. Right. It's a movie you can watch over and over. It's always fresh. It's funny. Alec Baldwin is very young in the movie. <laughs> He's uh, young and scary. Skinny. And I'm always like, that's right. Yeah. Alec Baldwin skinny. has had de- many different looks throughout his life. So, yeah. yeah. But anyway, you know what? I don't know. We'll see. You know, you know, I, I always go into these things with an open mind. So we'll see. But, you know, I, I don't know. I've seen this similar thing before. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. All right. Well, speaking of things that have been redone and rebooted, uh, Ghostbusters yeah. Frozen Empire out right now in theaters. What did you think? Yeah. Talk about squeezing blood out of a stone. Uh, oh, yeah. no. <laughs> I mean, th- this latest Ghostbusters movie, it's like number five in the franchise. It's like the 40th anniversary, I think, of the existence of these movies the first one came out in 1984 i think yeah oh, wow. that's right yeah Thanks and that me feel old tim thank you I, okay. oh me too <laughs> yeah i i saw that one in the theater I, I ouch anyway that one starred dan Aykroyd, bill murray and they're they return this one and also returning in this one are actors uh, annie potts and william atherton and ernie hudson god they all must feel so old appearing in a franchise that they all first appeared in 40 right. years ago they're back the only thing they didn't do is bring back sigourney weaver but you know her price probably was too high anyway i think it's about time they stop making these movies you know they they'll continue most probably as long as they keep breaking in the cash and there's really this is good or is it just the storyline stupid you know what i liked about what that's the thing you know the original ghostbusters movie was daffy and silly and 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 that's what made the original so beloved what i liked about this one had nothing to do with the fact that it was a ghostbusters movie and the way we look at these ghostbusters movies because in a way they had nowhere else to go but in this one they they make this effort to inject some like thematic grist uh, into the in, in, into the story. I mean, this one actually opens with a poem by Robert Frost. Ooh, they talk okay. about quantum mechanics. Uh, they, they throw some metaphysics in, but, uh, you know, like about where we go when we die and all that. But all right. that really undercuts the daffiness that made the original one so beloved. And by doing all of this, to me, it just shows they really have nowhere else to go with this franchise. And if this is, installment never existed, I doubt it would hardly be missed. I suppose... I, 
really, if you've never seen a movie before or any of the other prequels, I mean, like you're a little kid and you go into this movie, your parents take you to see it, you might go, wow, there's all this cool effects and blah, okay. blah, 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 blah. But I just sat there, eyes glazed over, thinking to myself, God, I hope this is the last and final Ghostbusters ah, movie I will ever okay. have to sit through. Yeah, you know, one of the original characters says in the film, one of the original characters actually says this, and I wrote it down because it made me laugh, because it was said right at the time I was thinking it, but the guy said, the William Atherton character who plays like a law enforcement guy, he says, you know, for 40 years, I've been wanting to say that the Ghostbusters are finished. Oh, well, yeah, maybe with this will be it. Yeah, Hopefully this will be the final installment, and if they finally will be finished, yeah. All right, I think, well, yeah, you know. go, well, I mean, from the Ghostbusters, obviously Tim is a no on that. From the Ghostbusters to the devil, Late Night with the Devil, you described this to me as found footage horror film. Yeah. I, yeah. Is this yeah. mean that we're going to see like real police video? Like, what is that? Well, it's being advertised as one of those found footage horror movies like The Blair Witch Project, but it oh, isn't as found. It isn't okay. as found footagey as that one. I think they're they're just trying to classify it because it's kind of different. It's it's a fun and clever. Uh, a uh, fun concept horror movie. The premise is that there's this late night uh, 1970s talk show host okay. of a show called Night Owls, who's in competition with Johnny Carson, but always winds up second in the Nielsen TV ratings. And the movie purports to be this rediscovered master tape of this episode of the show's final season broadcast on Halloween in like 1977. And during this live broadcast, which is about parapsychology and satanic cults and mass suicides, all hell breaks loose on the set. That's all I can say. <laughs> Oh, okay. And and so the movie's done in this conceit of this rediscovered tape of a show that was only shown once, and we learn why it was never shown again. Which, if you think about it, it's kind of silly. But if you're not, if you you're, you're not really meant to think too much about what it is you're watching, you're just supposed to go with it. And if you do, the movie turns out to be this kind of fun horror romp, which uh, you do have to kind of wait for. Well, for the payoff, you have to wait for because the payoff is very horror centered, and everything up to that point is just kind of fun and silly. And you're going, well, "Where's this going?" You know. Yeah. But if you, if you, if you, it's it's especially cool if you've ever watched those like regional TV horror host TV showings of like horror movies like Sven Gulli and Creature Features, you know. But mix in a kind of like a late night '70s talk show format, and that's that's what this movie is. It's kind of hard to describe, actually, but it is clever. It's fun. If it has a message, it's like saying, "Hey, beware of the consequences of selling your soul for good ratings." Ah, uh, there okay. are consequences, but yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, I enjoyed it. I, okay, I thought good. it was good. Yeah, it was good. nice. All yeah. right. Well, is he selling his soul, William Shatner? You can call me Bill. No, I don't think he's selling his soul. Uh, yeah, this. <laughs> This one is for Captain Kirk and Star Trek and William Shatner fans. It's the nice. new documentary. It's If you like any of that, this definitely is the movie of the week for you. It's what the title says. It's all about the actor, William Shatner. He he is a total effing inspiration. He's, 90, he's 93. And this guy comes across he like looks a good for 93. He does. And he's... He's also mentally sharp as a tack. He's never at a loss for words. And he's on camera here in this movie talking about and reflecting on his life and acting career. There's copious amounts of clips from his film stage and television career. It's amazing watching this. It's, it's just a brief, like, 89-minute documentary. But you're watching this and you're going, my God, this guy has done everything you know and i've always loved shatner as an actor uh, the character of captain kirk in in all of the star trek iterations as well as the william shatner the person the man the the rock on tour like i said this guy's never at a loss for words he reminds me of something a publicist once told me about this loquacious actor he said about the actor an actor who just loved to talk when the publicist was setting up an, an interview with that actor for our radio show he said just put a nickel in a slot and he'll go on for several minutes <laughs> that and that's william shatner yeah. you know the screening i attended was followed by one of those uh, live stream q and a's with with shatner and that was great fun apparently this movie too this is interesting because I know your 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 program is crowdfunded, but this is the first movie of its type in that 
it was actually financed by fans of the actor, hundreds of fans, like a crowdfunding thing, only these fans, by investing money, have a piece of the profits of whatever the film takes in. So I think oh. that's an I think that's a new thing. Anyway, this is great. I loved it. It's a hundred percent catnip for, for Star Trek fans. And what's also really interesting, I know I'm going on about this, but the because the movie's filled with life and energy and and, and the sheer presence of this man, William Shatner. But it's interesting that he makes no bones about his observation. Uh, and this is how the movie begins. He talks about, because he's been around so long, he talks about humankind being well on its way to extinction because of what we're doing to the planet. Oh, so he starts yeah. on an upbeat note, Tim. That's yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, not an upbeat. Yeah, you're thinking, my God, is this how this movie's going <laughs> to start? But he does tie it all in. He's so reflective yeah. and i mean yeah. you know he's lived 93 years so he's so seen he has, a lot yeah exactly yeah, yeah, well that's so. awesome okay great now yeah. is this in theaters yeah uh in theaters yes it's in theaters okay yeah. uh now this one i saw on my streaming this is amazon prime and i cannot wait to see another reboot <laughs> roadhouse, roadhouse with Jake Gyllenhaal. I'll take yeah it okay uh, crazy role yeah kill me now um, oh no, oh, no. Wait, 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 wait wait a minute wait a minute wait it's okay this Oh my God, this movie is testosterone on steroids. Okay. It's a reimagining of the Patrick Swayze movie, the right. one that came out in 1989. Only this one amps up the killing and the UFC fighting and the violence to what can only be termed unimaginable oh. and so extreme. You know, I texted a friend after I'd seen this movie and I told him when it was all over that, that I felt as though I had just been through a wood chopper. Honest to God. Interesting. It, okay. 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 Jake Gyllenhaal, fabulous, versatile actor. I, he's great. He oh. plays this UFC fighter. He has his dark past, right? He comes to this place in Florida, Glass Key, Florida, where he tries and, and up to a point succeeds in bringing some semblance of order to this roadhouse that's run by this benign but like rough and tough lady. And, and this roadhouse happens to be plagued by this bunch of like out of control crazy bullies who just go in there and beat people up all the time but that's not all it turns out that the the the, the, the super corrupt local government run by criminals in an organized crime mafia way because drugs are involved too wants to close this roadhouse to make way for land developments nasty nasty stuff you never ever want to mess with that high level of criminality <laughs> you know when drugs are involved and money forget it forget it anyway so what did i think this movie I'm telling you, it, it's a prime example of the extent to where physical violence has gone or what violence has become on screen oh. beyond the physical, beyond the visceral, to the point where you feel psychically pummeled. It's so violent. And it's not the cartoony violence of a, like a Quentin Tarantino movie. But what, what the director, Doug Lyman, seems to be striving for here is a kind of like realism in in the violence and and one that's so extreme that it just goes beyond any description of what i can provide at this time gyllenhaal is terrific in oh, the good. movie it's a real star turn for him he plays this shane like like character of a mysterious figure with the past with this combination of like sinisterness and sweetness and scariness but he's also really really funny I mean, he delivers some of these lines after some of these scenes where it, it's it's hilarious. Anyway, and he's ripped beyond. Yeah, and, and those are real muscles. I remember I was reading a bunch of articles yeah, about yeah, him. Yeah, so. you know, and yeah, I, I John, bet, those are. I, yeah, <laughs> I, th I suspect he suffered some like high level of body harm in the making of this film <laughs> because he literally, and there's no faking this. I mean, he's literally being thrown over, you they know. They have stunned men, Tim. You know this, right? I know, but. <laughs> And you could see where they employed the stuntman, but there were scenes where they did not fake it because right. the camera never leaves him, right? Right, and, right, uh, right. And, you know, th th there's this palpable tension in the film, to its credit. It's it's really well done. I mean, okay. but it's so, it's so... So violent. It's very, very violent. So you have to be able to watch the violence to get to the good parts, I guess. Really, really. And it, it's uh, just for pure visceral bloodlust entertainment. And but, but it's also a movie that in a lot of ways appeals to all of our basis <laughs> instincts. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it really... I mean, you're really, like, rooting for these bullies to get 
got to get ripped. Yeah. Um, anyway, anyway. <laughs> All right. I'll tell you, it was, I, I never once thought of the time when I was watching this movie. It just, it's so, it's, yeah, so, I mean. Is, are you if, recommending if this, or no? Yeah. I don't. Uh, I'm watching I, Well, this. I'm, I'm. Yeah, I, I'd have to recommend it, but I'm just saying, you know, watch. I mean, if you're really susceptible to to being affected by this kind of violence, you may you may want to think twice. But as a movie, it's it's well directed. It's I, like I said, I never once thought of my watch. It was entertaining if you like violent movies. Mm, entertaining yeah. as hell, and of course, you know, Gyllenhaal's great. So yeah, Gyllenhaal yeah. is Jake Gyllenhaal. All right, yeah. now let's uh, our last one real quickly is Immaculate with Sydney Sweeney. Is she playing a nun? I can only imagine. Yeah, yeah. This is a big time, like, psychological horror movie with the uh, backdrop of the Catholic Church. And in particular, a Catholic convent for elderly and terminally ill nuns. Uh, and yeah, Sydney Sweeney plays this young nun. She's nearly drowned when she was a girl and she was pronounced like dead for seven minutes, but she comes back to life from this near death experience, believing that God now had this purpose for her, right? So she becomes a nun. She goes to this convent somewhere off in Italy, but, but nobody knows where exactly it is. And the convent tends to dying nuns in their final days. So she's there to serve those nuns. But once they are very slowly, <laughs> all hell, really all hell breaks loose in this convent. So you know, <laughs> I'm laughing because hmm. uh, it was funny. The movie kind of didn't make a lot of sense, but for like mood and atmosphere, it, it, it couldn't be beat. I mean, it's really effective. It slowly works on you. It, it, or works its way onto you because when it's over you kind of feel even though you know much of it was left ambiguous and illogical and unexplained you're going well how could this happen and what's going on here there's an emotional logic to the whole enterprise but when it's all over you kind of feel like you've been hit by a mac truck oh. in a good way in a good way okay. and if you've ever you know if you've ever been heavily brought up in a religion you know, I was okay. by Catholicism. You know, I, <laughs> yep. I went to Catholic school. I attended Catholic church. I served mass. I was an altar boy. I did the whole thing. Uh, there's something, this is this is petty me, but there was something very satisfying about this movie in an emotionally retributive sense. A lot of my buttons were pushed watching this movie, even though I saw it ultimately as a, a, a like a feminist movie. It was a, and it oh. made a feminist statement because in the end, what Immaculate is really about to me, which is why I, I just grooved on it, is religious stupidity, you know, religious extremism and religious insanity. And the main character, Sister Cecilia's, she just, she, she really, I can say this, this is not a spoiler, but she really socks it to the Catholic patriarchy. And in oh. particular, there, the ending is so defiant where she's basically saying as a woman more than as a nun nobody but nobody especially no religion is going to tell me what i can or cannot do with my body wow. and i when it when it was over i really did want to stand up and friggin cheer and i thought well is this me nice. or what but this was a kick-ass beautifully directed horror movie you know just don't think about it don't like try to figure out like how certain things came to be. They just are, but go with it. And honestly, when it was over, I saw it with a small select audience, but people just sat there going, what the hell just happened? You know, <laughs> that sounds really good. I'm going to have to put that on my watch list. It, it's good. Nikki, I actually thought of you. I, I said, yeah, this is one I can, you know, nice. Nikki will you like. don't yeah. often yeah. say that I'm going to like a horror movie. So that's definitely on my list. Right. I'm not always right though, about what you're going to like and not like, but I True. think, I think, I think I you'll like this one. I never yeah. think that people are going to like scary horror movies anyway. Like, cause it's really hard to get a good, like critic rating on many of them if they're not like a horror kind of genre type of yeah, critic. Yeah, right. But right. um, but if you liked it, Tim, that that means a lot to me. No, I really did. I I think the church will hate this movie. <laughs> well, I mean, they they'll really, really hate like, yeah. This they don't movie. like anything that makes them look bad, Tim. We know that much. We know that. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. All right, Tim Zika. Thank okay. you so much. We will talk right. to you next Yay. Friday. Okay, Bye. Okay. Talk to you next week. Bye. 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 Yeah, that's kind of cool. So yeah, I'm gonna see. I'm definitely gonna see. Immaculate, but I'm probably going to wait for streaming. Mm -hmm. Roadhouse this weekend, though, my friend. I think that's one that I'm just going to have to I sit. think the, his discussion of the gore in that one has 
Oh, you are such it. a wush. Whatever. I'll <laughs> watch it for you. I will watch it for you. And then what was the other one? Okay, so Immaculate, yes. Roadhouse, yes. La- late late Night with the Devil, which was kind of like the found horror. I might if it's streaming. But I'm going to have to see Ghostbusters because yeah. I have a boy that wants to see Ghostbusters. And then the William Shatner one. You can call me Bill. That looks interesting for all the Shatner fans out there. So a good choice of things to watch this weekend all right that's our show you guys another quick thank you to those that donated to the super chat of course you could do this even during the replay spencer with five dollars blue spark with 10 wes with a five dollar super sticker and of course marilyn came in with a five dollar nice. super sticker as well we thank you guys so very much can you please go to our oh go ahead i was just gonna say before we go can i tell you the joke that president biden made at president trump's expense oh please it's really quick all okay, right go. President Biden says this. Just the other day, a defeated looking man came up to me and said, Mr. President, I have crushing debt and I'm completely wiped out. (laughs) President Biden said, and I had to look at him and say, Donald, I'm sorry, I can't help you. (laughs) But I'm bunch. Yeah. uh, And Biden is swimming in campaign funds, Mm -hmm. as you can imagine. Um, But yeah, that's a good. Yeah, it's going to be fun to watch Monday. We're going to know what's going to happen with Trump's assets. So we will definitely be keeping our eye on that. Uh, We want to swim in funds, though. So go to the the Nikki Maduro (laughs) show dot com. Our Patreon link is right there. Thank you so much for those that have consistently supported us right. every single month. We love you guys so, so very much. So please go there, thenikimadoroshow.com, and donate. Just It's a one-time-a-month payment, and we really do need it. PayPal, of course, is always available. Go to paypal.com, hit the send button, and then just put in the email address, thenikimadoroshow at gmail.com. All right, stay here for the Mark Thompson Show, and then, of course, Kim with the After Party Live. Have a fabulous weekend. Stay dry. Bye bye. Bye. Nikki, you're all so awesome. You sprout like a beautiful blossom. You're all so the best. I really can't rest. You're all so awesome. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs>